Okay, welcome everyone to uh, our second forum uh, put forth by the California Portuguese American Coalition and the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute from California State University, Fresno. We're excited uh, to have this wonderful panel of young Portuguese Americans throughout the state. We have indeed uh, representation from different uh, geographical areas, all the way from San Diego to San Francisco, um, and, uh, and including the San Joaquin Valley. And um, our topic, as all of you know, is uh, racism and discrimination, a California Portuguese American perspective. Uh, I want to, of course, uh, thank the California Portuguese American Coalition, our board, for uh, putting forth these, uh, these forums, um, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institutes, and for these forums to be archived in our library as well, and, of course, the uh, Fundação Luso-Americana para o Desenvolvimento, FLAD, uh, who is a sponsor of both CPAC and uh, PBBI. We have uh, five young people from different parts of the states. Um, it's going to be, for those of you who did our uh, first forum, uh, who followed us um, here about a month ago, uh, it's a very, um, uh, let's put it, uh, easy conversation. Um, there's not a, a lot of formality to it. I think everyone knows who I am. I'm Denise Borges, and I'm the director of PBBI and, and current president of uh, CPAC. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you to introduce yourself, take about three, four, five minutes, however you feel you need to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, besides your name, who you are, a little bit about your curriculum, and, um, and it's essentially also your Portuguese connection. I know that uh, lots of the people who are following us, and by the way, we are on Facebook Live, if you'd like to follow us. If you are on Facebook Live, leave the comment there. If not, you can use chat to leave any co comments or those of you who are following us. Um, or also pose a question anytime throughout the uh, conversation. We'll try to keep just about an hour and 15 minutes or so. So um, we will start. Is there a voluntario or should I have a victim? Um, I think we should start in, in the south end of the state. How's that? We'll start with Amanda. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, perfect. <laughs> right on. Um, let's see, born and raised here in San Diego. My father is from Pico and my mom is from San Jorge. So I'm full blood Azores. That's all I've ever known. I was blessed with the opportunity to get to visit there in the summers. Um, and I had an opportunity to live and work and study there. I did a study abroad program at uh, Universidad Domingo. And then I did an internship with Benfica in their marketing division. So that was quite the experience. Um, here at home, I've always been really involved in our local community, um, dance group, Festa, Cabrillo Festival, uh, always kind of had my, my hands in the mix. Um, as I became older and started working full time, um, I wasn't as closely involved with the organizations, but I'm still very much involved um, as a musician. I sing in our, uh, one of our local Portuguese cover bands and um, still very, very passionate about the culture. Um, I tutor beginners in Portuguese as um, kind of a, a side business, and I've been doing that for about 10 years. Um, and I had an awesome opportunity to um, work with the Azorian government in 2016, where I'm called Jovens uh, Embaixadores na Diaspora. And the whole idea was taking people like me, first generation Americans or from all over the world, really, children of immigrants that had gone to different places in the world and bringing them back to the islands and educating them about economy, business, culture, food, tourism. Um, so I'm grateful for that experience and uh, hope to continue my involvement with the Portuguese and Azorian government. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Amanda. So uh, let's uh, go to David. Since we are in Pico, we may as well stay in Pico. <laughs> David Garcia. <laughs> uh, yeah, David Garcia, born and raised uh, here in San Jose. Both my parents are from the island of Pico. Um, my daytime job is a data center manager, so I'm actually still at work. Um, uh, I'm a client success manager at a data center, and, uh, and my involvement in the community has been all my life involved with anything that's Portuguese, you name it, whether it was Portuguese marching bands, folklore, carnaval, the church, the Spitzenfestes, uh, and now the latest and greatest, Fado. I've been singing Fado now for a little over 10 years, so, yeah. 
Indeed, uh, David is uh, in everything that is Portuguese in the uh, in the, in the Northern California. I got my hands. Uh, okay, uh, shall we go to Michael? Yeah. So, also keeping with the Picaro theme, um, I'm Michael. I was born and raised in uh, Castro Valley, California, where I still live. I'm a second generation Portuguese American. I have maternal grandparents from the island of Pic and Ilhavu in the mainland, and then paternal grandparents from Madeira and Sobral da Serra, which is uh, kind of near Serra da Estrela. Hmm. I grew up in the Bay Area Portuguese community, volunteering at FESHA, as I'm sure like a, a lot of my fellow panelists, and participating in Luso American Youth Council activities. And then I later danced in Rancho Folclorico Portugal na California. In college, I studied Portuguese at UC Davis, uh, where they had recently started a Portuguese program, and I was lucky enough to be the second person to graduate with a minor uh, in Portuguese. And then I also got to study abroad in Portugal for a summer. And for the past seven years, I've had the honor of serving as a San Pablo Holy Ghost Association director, uh, where I do a lot of my volunteering in my free time. And in general, I, I enjoy learning more and more of our kind of Californian Portuguese American heritage and learning how to kind of be uh, like a better contributor to the community. Um, and I split my time volunteering between San Pablo and SDS and Alvarado. Fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, Rose? Rose? Rose Martins. Rosa Martins, um, family is from Quatro Quiveiras, Terceira. Uh, I was born and raised in Tulare, California, so Central Valley, and fortunate to have like a, a rich Portuguese community in Tulare. Um, so definitely always into everything that was going on there and very fortunate to be able to go to Terceira and spend lots of time there on the island with the family and really get to know the culture more and um, explore the history of everything and um, just have the first hand. Um, and I, I, I love it. I feel very, very fortunate to um, be Portuguese and to be Portuguese American. So. And uh, great. And you, and you go back quite often, I know. Yeah, as much as I can. I love yeah. it. And uh, last but certainly not uh, least, uh, Dr. Monique Kelly Valens. Well, my, as you said, my name is Monique Valens. Um, I, I was born and raised in the Central Valley, uh, the Modesto area where I still live. My mom is from St. George, and my dad is from the Avedo area, which is actually from Bush, which is near Ilovo. Um, <laughs> he's a portista too, so you like him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've always been involved with the Portuguese community since I was a kid, Philharmonicish, folklore, just like everybody else. And I've always loved being Portuguese. In fact, I'm often accused of being militantly Portuguese. Um, so when I went to college, I studied history and I decided to uh, get my PhD in Portuguese history. And I went to Portugal and did my research there for my dissertation. Um, but academia didn't really work out. For me so I, I went into business with my mom and we do accounting we have a, an accounting office in downtown modesto but we're sort of more like the uh, portuguese social welfare center because we get people we don't just do taxes we do preparations we do translations we also i have my ladies who come to the office and i read their la their mail for them <laughs> we do social security medicare and kind of just help people um where they don't know where else to turn they call us you know can you do my divorce no but uh you know <laughs> Can help with something else um, and then uh, now I'm still involved in, with the Modesto Fest I'm on the board of directors I'm involved in a folklore group in Hillmar and um, I'm on the board of this, the uh, education Portuguese Education Foundation of Central California and I guess probably right now what's taking up most of my time is being a uh, supreme president of the Portuguese Fraternal Society. Busy and yeah. she's also <laughs> and she's also a contributing uh, historian to the Portuguese American Hour with a wonderful history segment every single Thursday uh, between 4 and 5 p.m., a 10 to 12 minute segment, which is uh, really a lot of fun. Uh, I have people tell me all the time, if uh, my high school teacher taught history the way Monique does, I might have enjoyed it. So, you know, she, <laughs> she's a lot of fun. Um, so let's take our, our first uh, question um, and kind of a question that I'll, I, I'm not going to pick on anybody in particular to start that I will ask for a volunteer. Um, if, if not, I, I will pick someone, but... Um, uh, and that's the main reason why we're here. So in your opinion and, um, and your dealings, all of you have dealt 
uh, intensively with the Portuguese American community. You've been involved in you know the community one way or another just about all your lives. And so um, in your dealings with our community, with our Portuguese American community, either where you live or if you've moved to a different area, you know, you, your hometown or the area you're living in now, um, is, uh, is there a, uh, in the Portuguese American community, when it comes to racism, have you seen it? Um, have you, have you, is it visible uh, as far as racism in the community? Uh, how do you feel Portuguese Americans in general uh, feel about this topic that's quite uh, at the top of uh, our national debate right now. And it has been, as all of you know, since the uh, death of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, but even before then, uh, but certainly in the last few months. Um, so I'd like to take each and every one of you from different geographical areas. You uh, have different contexts. So how do you feel racism is seen in the Portuguese American community where you're from and uh, have you seen it manifested in how um, in the community? Anyone would like to start? It's, it's, a, it's, it's always the first person is always the <laughs> toughest one to start. Yeah, but uh, someone's got to step up. Amanda, I think, is about ready to step up, isn't she? Yeah, she just, she just <laughs> went off, off, off mute, so she's going to go. Well, I was just going to say I went first, so, <laughs> but here we go. Um, um, you know, I think my, my answer episode and um, racism in the Portuguese-American community is a bit of an inherent thing. Um, we were raised with um, comments that, that we were raised to believe as normal, right? And I think in a lot of, in a majority of the cases, you're dealing with, you know, good people with good hearts that don't necessarily have dismay for different races, but it's almost um, like what they call systemic racism, things that have been ingrained in our everyday lives and in our jargon that, um, that we don't even think twice about. Right, like growing up, you know, um, in Southern California, we have a very strong Mexican community. And so when the cleaning lady would come, my mom would say, you know, Amanda vai limpar o teu quarto, que a mexicana vai vir. You know, and it wasn't meant to be derogatory. She just meant to tell me, you know, the cleaning lady's coming. And so it's one of those things where you see it, but it's become normalized. Um, but I think that now that these things are happening in our society and we have a generation of people that are becoming more educated about, um, you know, psychology, communication, um, all of these topics, my hope is that this norm, this norm can change. I think our society has become a lot more politically correct, sometimes a little bit too much, but I think it's, it's causing difficult conversations to happen. And we're starting to realize, oh my gosh, what I was doing this whole time was really messed up and we should change those norms. Um, so it's definitely there. I, I definitely think that there's a, um, just like in any culture, there's a group of people that are a lot more harsh about their opinions and other people that are doing it mindlessly. Uh, but the point is, you know, the, the hope is that now we start paying attention to, um, you know, how we say what we say. Um, so that's kind of my general perception to answer that question. Hopefully that. Yeah, so. that did. Very interesting. <laughs> you take. Rose, would you like to chime in on it, please? Sure. Um, I definitely agree with most of the things that um, Amanda said. And I think it is, you know, just knowing the people that I know in the culture and even being back in Portugal, it is things that have been passed down generation to generation without even thinking about it. And here in America specifically, I mean, white supremacy is really ingrained in most of our systems and we don't even think about it. And I think it is important the, the time that we have now where people are making having the discussions and bringing it to the forefront. And obviously it's not a comfortable discussion because nobody wants to be painted as a bad person. But the thing is, is you have to wake up and see like things that you may not have been thinking of and 
see that, okay, it should be done a different way and I should be thinking a different way and we need to open up um, the discussion so then that way we can all work together and we can all heal together um, because especially here in the United States of America, racism was ingrained from the start. So um, we have to have these difficult conversations and be honest with ourselves so that way we can move forward together. Indeed. Um, I guess my, my opinion on this is, you know, the immigrants have uh, spent their lives fighting for their culture and for their traditions in this country. And so sometimes they feel threatened by it when they see other cultures mingle with ours. And I've seen it firsthand, even with our, our own Portuguese church, unfortunately, it's been a struggle these last couple of years with that fear of, oh my God, we're gonna lose our church to the Filipino community, for example, because our church has a huge Filipino community within the church. Uh, and so they stand very guarded and I've heard, you know, lots of comments. I've seen of lots of eye rolls and, you know, you're growing up, you know, if you want to say something bad, say it in Portuguese so they don't know you're talking about. <laughs> and so unfortunately that has happened quite often. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I, I don't think Portuguese assume that they're racist until it affects their family or one of their children uh, marries outside the culture. Uh, I know that's been a big factor in a lot of families. And I just, I just find it funny where I hear a parent say, oh, you have to marry a Portuguese person. And I'm like, well, then you shouldn't have immigrated. Uh, you should have stayed in Portugal if that's the case. And then on the other hand, I, had, I have a couple of friends. Who he, one of them, he has three daughters. And all, of, all three of them married outside of the Portuguese race. And I asked him, how do you feel about that? And he said, how should I feel? I love them all. They make my daughters happy. They're great men. And that's all I wanted for them. So you have a little bit of both, but racism definitely exists in the community. And even just within the last 24 hours with the announcement of uh, Kamala Harris, oh, yeah. my Facebook has blown up. And I've seen some true colors out there that aren't pretty. So it exists for sure. I want to say something to David's point about uh, retaining our culture. And I feel like like lots of cultures here in the United States, like that's part of the intention. But the thing is, is you can't, like we should recognize that we can't retain our culture by otherizing others. You know, it's like there's room for everyone and we should all be able to celebrate each other's cultures as well as celebrating your own culture. and. And I do think that is also the subconscious thing that their Portuguese Americans aren't realizing that they're doing. Indeed, Michael. Yeah, so I think uh, I think what what David said really resonates with me in terms of the kind of the lack of inclusion and I think the insularity that I really see in the community. Like to me, that it is hard to think uh, about the community being so white presenting and I think focused on like that being identity and like the R of uh, our culture is tied I think to like a predominantly white society um, that it's hard to think that like racism never had a role in kind of making that what it is today. Um, so I and I, I think that like that is kind of like a baseline that a lot of people experience and live and I think anything kind of thereafter is measured against that baseline. So if you marry outside uh, of the white Portuguese community. I think that is always noted, right? Um, I think that like myself, I've, I've married someone who is not Portuguese, uh, who identifies as Indian American. Um, and, you know, I've had comments directed towards me and like other friends who've married Muslims uh, about like, they're like basically losing their Portuguese-ness by kind of essentially not marrying into a white Portuguese uh, family or, or part marrying with a partner. So. It's, um, you know, that, that to me is like so deeply ingrained that I think some, I think it was Amanda started talking about this as well, like until we kind of deconstruct that, that initial starting place, like we're going to totally have racism within our community. Monique? Well, yeah, I mean, what everybody said, I, you know, I don't want to repeat it, but one thing that I found really interesting is, you know, coming from the Northern San Joaquin Valley, we already don't have very many African Americans here to begin with. And so um, I kind of noted kind of like this duality where it's like, yeah, we definitely had um, 
racism, you know, like we have one, one man from, was from Angola and unfortunately they would call him Uprit. And I didn't realize that that was, you know, there was anything wrong with that because we kind of grew up in this bubble where, you know, here it was like, I felt like my grand, we lived with my grandparents and my mom was about 20 when she immigrated here. And there was this like fear of the outer American community where it was like, anybody who wasn't Portuguese was not to be trusted. Anybody who wasn't Portuguese was somehow not as good as us. And nobody ever actually said that, but I would, you know, my grandparents would say comments like, oh, you do that like an American. So that would, I kind of internalized this idea that Americans were bad because they, they're impolite and they eat with their hands and they do all of this, this stuff. And, you know, you know, David, you're so right. It's like, well, if you don't like Americans, why are you here? But I kind of always had this feeling like, we're here because we don't, we don't really want to be here. We kind of came because we had to. And so we're going to try to stay as Portuguese as we can while we're here. Um, but, you know, if you want to go stay at your friend's house, uh, we're not going to let that happen because her parents are going to rape you and give you drugs. And that was like the answer I got all the time. So I can only hang out with my Portuguese friends because we know them and I don't know those other people. Um, but I, what I think, something I think is really interesting, and I've always kind of noticed this, and I, I, I think that like, people in our Portuguese community, we almost feel like we have this otherness that's not Caucasian, that's not American, that's kind of not Hispanic, it's just Portuguese. And I've known people who will say like, oh, you know, because my husband's not Portuguese. Oh, so you married a white guy. And I'm just like, well, last time I checked, Portugal was in Europe. So you know you're white too, right? <laughs> just, or, um, you know, uh, people who will mark on the census before we had this, you know, this year, yes, we, we said mark Portuguese on the census, but in past on anything, I've had people tell me that they, they won't mark Caucasian, they'll mark other and they'll write in Portuguese. As if like we're like this separate race that doesn't really belong to anything, we're just kind of by ourselves. Well, uh, of course, that uh, you know, uh, you've all touched up on very important uh, aspects of it, and we could probably just t pick one of them and, and have the rest of the, of, the, uh, of the debate or the conversation about. But there's something that, I, that I'd like to ask each and every one of you, you know, when you, and, and you've touched on this as, as being a Portuguese American. So when we come to the, this country, and I say we because I came to this country at the age of 10, all of you did not. Obviously, your parents or your grandparents were the ones that, were, that, that immigrated. Um, it kind of, you know, uh, people want to belong and it's, and, it, and, and they don't want to feel discriminated. And that's why we have people in the Portuguese American community that change their names, in the, especially in the 1930s and 40s, you know, Paredes, the Perrys, and all this kind of stuff that uh, all of you know about. Um, and so if you want to su succeed, you're going to kind of assimilate the, uh, the, 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 the group that is in power. And, you know, the, in power was the white Europeans. And, and, and when Monique says that, because... Uh, in the 1924 immigration law, there's uh, in the United States, there's, we were very penalized. We were considered the dark Europeans, okay, the Portuguese, the 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 Turks, uh, the the Italians, etc. And so, my question to you is: the some of this racism that you see, and all of you can comment, or just one in particular, uh, the some of this racism that you see within the Portuguese American community comes from wanting to assimilate so much that we want to be American, although there is the aspect that Monique was saying, you know, in the house you are Portuguese, but do you want to be American? You want to fit in to the dominant group that is calling the shots within the American system. Does that make any sense as a question? Or is it anybody <laughs> like to comment on that? Or uh, Michael, I think, wants to comment. He's, he's thinking. I am, I am thinking because I'm, I'm thinking about like I... I'm sure this is not a lot of folks experience, but I mean, my, my experience with my grandparents is that they, they never had this attitude of like, well, I made it now. So uh, great. We're integrated and mm -hmm. we're just going to like stick to what we know. Like they, they expressed nothing. Um, you know, even coming from like 1930s and forties people, uh, they expressed nothing about kind of exclusivity. And I don't really think they lived that. So I'm, I'm smiling. I was, I was reflecting on kind of like, all right, did I ever see them do that? Um, yes, they were very much involved in the Portuguese immigrant community and bonded a lot and like a lot of their friends were fellow immigrants and that's great. But I don't know, like, and that's kind of maybe my, my that more informs my take on things of like, okay, where, at what point did we ever say we would only community organize and community build and fundraise for Portuguese by Portuguese? Like why, why are we stopping at kind of just those more immediate 
neighbors and community members. Um, like if, if you do successfully integrate and you do kind of maintain culture, tradition, et cetera, why not kind of build your community outward from there? I just keep going then by, by then, like obviously you can kind of include more and more groups. So I think people who are not even uh, Portuguese or who identify as Portuguese. Anybody want to add that thought? Well, you know, I mean, in my experience, is, oh, sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, <laughs> it, it, wanting to be part of the American society, does that uh, kind of, um, um, is that a contributing factor to Portuguese Americans uh, becoming, you know, racist? Okay, let's use the word without <laughs> any, any quotes. Becoming racist because uh, of the systemic racism that you mentioned, you know, uh, all of you did in one way or another, that exists in our society. And so um, you want to belong to the group that is in power. Is that, that, did that contribute to how uh, racism is expressed in one way or another in the Portuguese community? Monique, you were saying. Well, I was saying that, uh, you know, I, I kind of, well, to, to speak to what you were saying, Dimitri, I, uh, I feel like, at least in a lot of people's cases, yes, you know, there's this idea that systemic racism was already existed here in the United States, so it definitely made it easier. But I think a lot of Portuguese people, at least in my experience, came already kind of racist, but mainly because they grew up in an island with everybody looked like them, everybody was Catholic like they were, everybody thought like they did. And so then they come here, my mom said, you know, she was 20 years old when she first saw someone who was African American and she was scared because she had never seen that before. And she had been told stories about people with dark skin who would like kidnap you or do whatever. So I think that plays a lot into it. Um, for me, I think like the, you know, I definitely have like my cousins that, you know, were born there but don't speak any Portuguese because my aunts and uncles try to get them to assimilate, you know, and I think the 60s and 70s, there was this big push to like be American, speak English. But I almost feel like I grew up in the backlash of that because then it's like, you have this idea where, you know, people told Portuguese jokes at school. And um, there was this idea that like, well, I don't want to be American anyway. Uh, you know, we want to stick with our own. And um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I, I just feel like we, you know, because I also felt like, from from the outside American community, like, oh, why do you speak Portuguese? You should speak English. You're not an American if you don't speak English. And, you know, oh, you're Catholic. That's weird. You're going to go to hell. So I think there was kind of this like push and pull where it's like, you know, we kind of felt like we weren't wanted in some ways. So it's like we gave up trying to assimilate, at least, you know, people I know. And then we're just like, well, fine, we'll just go be with our people over here and not even try with them. To build on, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rose. Thank you, David. I just wanted to say real quick and to yeah, basically build on what Monique uh, was saying in regards to coming over with it. I mean, we have to also acknowledge that Portugal was a colonizing nation and it's not just Portuguese Americans who are racist. Like there's, there's racism in Portugal, it's proper. Um, and it is the fifth most spoken language in the world because of colonization and, and all of the Portuguese history which I also think lots of Portuguese Americans don't even know what the Portuguese history is and just world history in general and the part that Portuguese, Portugal played in the racism and dehumanization of African people. David. No, to, to build on that, uh, it, when you said, when Denise, when you had mentioned the, the immigrants coming over and trying to assimilate to the American culture or American life, I haven't really seen that, at least with the people that I've been associated with. I've seen them immigrate here to achieve that American dream, which is everybody knows, oh, I want to buy a house and have a family. That's the American goal. And many of them have achieved that. Um, but they've done so still maintaining strong roots in their culture and their identity. Um, and then many of them, like Monique said, you know, came over here for the first time in the 60s or 70s, having never seen a Mexican, a black man, or an Asian. They saw that all here. Uh, in regards to the black man, well, maybe it's an association due to the war in the colonies where they fought against the black man in Africa, in Angola, and Mozambique. And that was something that was associated with them as being bad. And so that negative content was brought with them. Um, I personally haven't experienced it directly with me, but I've seen that within the family that it, it's definitely a factor. 
Anyone else want to add to that, Todd? So basically looking at that, and, I, and both of you, uh, all three of you, in the last comment made, uh, um, talked about Portugal being uh, involved in the slave trade. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be the historian here. The historian here is Monique. But um, Portugal was involved in the slave trade. We all know. We all heard the stories, you know, the, even the basics of it. Uh, we were no angels by any stretch of the imagination in that, in that aspect. And then, as you mentioned, as, uh, as uh, Rose brought up, the uh, decolonization, we were a colonial power. Uh, in Brazil, and we were a colonial power with the indigenous folks, and we were colonial power in Africa, and we were the last call. We were the last colonial European power, so we were fighting, as David mentioned, a war, which that's why many people came to the United States uh, was all, not just economic reasons, but also because they did not want their uh, male sons, their boys, to go to the war because at the age of eighteen you go to you, you go to fight, uh, unless you were in a seminary, and. Um, and so, um, and so during the Salazar regime, and this was actually mentioned by uh, one of the panelists in the last debate, the, the last conversation that we had, uh, Telmo Faria and Telmo that you all know, uh, many of you know, and, and Telmo was, was talking about, you know, and so there's that generation in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, you know, up to, uh, to, until 1974 uh, and the Carnation Revolution that was taught that the Africans were the enemies. They were the the terrorists we called them. Okay, they were terrorists in their own country, uh, and so and so did that. And I think David, you touched upon that. Did that play a role in how people came to America, and then whether they were assimilated or not? I mean, they they brought this with them, and then it existed here in a different manner, but it existed here as well. So was it built up on, or was just it was basically you know, what we had. And my, my, my question to you or that I'd like you to comment on is do we need to do a better job? And I think that's been touched up a little bit in the Portuguese American community in talking about these things, because uh, a lot of these things are taboos. We don't talk about racism because what I hear when I tell uh, people, when we talk about this in the social uh, aspect is uh, I'm not going to talk about racism because you know, so racist. I'm not a racist. Uh, okay, well, let's, and then we, de we develop, uh, we, then we find out, you know, how they are, and, and some of them I found out today through David's uh, uh, Facebook page, and so the, the idea when he posted about uh, the, the nominee, and so the idea that, first of all, do we not talk about enough this in the Portuguese community, and is there a need for us to kind of re-examine the history of who we are as a people, whether we're first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, so some thoughts on that, please. I don't think we talk about it at all in our Portuguese community. Um, it, this platform is great and it addresses those who are tech savvy and know what a virtual forum is. Uh, but I think this discussion needs to be had in Portuguese on Portuguese mm -hmm. radio and hopefully in person once COVID lifts and things get better. This needs to be addressed to those who don't speak Portuguese and are in the older generation because essentially it was not to like blame them, but it was brought down from that generation on to us. Uh, a couple of comments that I've, I've been seeing coming up yeah. where, I mean, instantly you lock your doors when you're in a bad neighborhood or you see someone walking who's a different nationality or, or race and you, you lock your doors. That's something you grew up on. Uh, it, it probably wasn't done purposefully, but you're brought up at that age to know, okay, when a black person walks next to my car, I need to lock my doors. So... Okay. It needs to be had in the Portuguese community, for sure. And your thoughts on that, as far as, you know, do we need to move this a step forward? Amanda, I think you're going to say something. Yeah, you, you guys are bringing up all kinds of trigger words that are just, just connecting all the pieces for me. I mean, with the war, you, this mindset was created. You know, these older generations they raise their children the best way they know how to, the way that they were brought up. So these inherent wrong ways, ultimately, wrong ways of viewing people and thinking about people are being passed down. And the only way that that's going to break is, is if we change the way we teach our children, right? And it's if we start having conversations and, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but when you have when you keep these taboo topics locked up you're you're preventing people from educating themselves enough to make up their own minds and all of the sudden they're no longer labeled as racist or or catholic or whatever because 
just because that's the way it is or just because, oh, that's what I know. Um, so, you know, earlier when you guys were talking about assimilation, I think that it's really difficult to put that, that label on an entire culture because I do think that you have a group of Portuguese people that have that old school navigator conquistador kind of attitude where it's like, we are Portuguese, we're the best. And then you also have the other ones that were humble to be like, well, we came into this country with nothing and we're going to do our best to make our lives work in a new place. So, you know, in my, in my own community here in San Diego, you definitely see a huge mix of that. Um, I was somebody that my parents raised me to be very connected with my Portuguese roots. We were raised with the language. We were raised traveling there. But I have very close friends that are just as proud to be Portuguese, but their last names were changed and they don't speak a, a lick of the language because their parents or grandparents wanted them to be American. So it's a little bit difficult to put you know, labels on, on a whole culture. Um, but I think ultimately, sorry, I was, I was trying to get back to my original point. Uh, but ultimately, like what's happening here is that we're starting to have these difficult conversations. And the reason it's such a shocking thing is because it's always been taboo. So, you know, it's difficult, but it's necessary. Um, and I think that the only reason to kind of break that systemic racism is to start having the difficult conversations and letting people educate themselves enough to make up their own minds instead of blaming their ancestors. For now. <laughs> yeah, I think those are good points, but I think too that um, we conversation is good, but I think also um, us exposing ourselves to other cultures and other people like maybe we as young Portuguese Americans, you know, if we can find ways that we can connect with other cultures and expose people to other races, that I think that would also help because I think there's a lot of people out there that honestly, honestly think that they're not racist. I mean, my joke is always like when somebody says, not to be racist, but it's always gonna be followed by something racist, right? But there's people out there who honestly, and like growing up here, I thought I wasn't racist. Like I was, I could, I would tell you, no, I'm not racist, I like everybody. But when I went to college, I realized how racist I was because I had never really been exposed to people of a whole, I mean, just Hispanic people, Portuguese people, and then your quote unquote white people or your American people, um, you know, that, but I thought I wasn't racist. And I went to college and I met people who were African American and from lots of other different backgrounds. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so racist. You know? <laughs> so I think, you know, uh, if having conversation is good, but then there's going to be people out there who are like, I don't need to hear about this because I'm not racist. Michael? I, yeah, I think, so on the historical piece, I, so I have a, a friend who's Indonesian. She, I didn't even know there was like a significant Portuguese presence in Indonesia at one point. Like I knew about East Timor, but I did not know about Indonesia. Um, and she, she said this to me the other week and she said like, one, one man's history is another person's terror. Mm -hmm. um, and like that to me like encapsulates so much. And like from there, I think like why that perpetuates across generations, I think is because we, aren't really critical of our own history. And like we, it reminds me of like the education I received in the US. It's like, you get fifth grade US history and you just kind of like hear about how the country came to be and that's that. But like, if you, you know, as a senior in high school or a junior in high school uh, or beyond, you learn that like, okay, Manifest Destiny was like super messed up, intrinsically racist and imperialistic. And you don't have to scratch the surface that hard to like kind of get to that swath of history and see like the ugly side of how expansion and colonialism works. And I feel like we're kind of stuck as adults a lot of times in the community at like this fifth grade education level of like understanding our own history. Um, so I like, we're not, we're not being super critical. And I think as both Portuguese who are architects of the slave trade and accelerators of the slave trade and Americans who were the clients from the Portuguese after the Portuguese banned slavery within Portugal, um, like we're so uniquely positioned to reconcile with that part of history. Uh, and we're we're just not, and I think I think to what the panelists have said of, you know, people don't think they're personally racist, so they don't have to reconcile with the the heritage and the history of it um, is is super common, and that you know does need to change. I think both in online and in person conversations. Rose, I agree with everything that everyone said, and um, 
I really agree with Monique's point about exposure. Um, you know, be, the Portuguese community, it, it is closed off. And, um, and, and I mean, and I understand that's to preserve the culture as well. But the thing is, is once you get exposure to other cultures or education beyond your fifth grade education, as Michael um, said, and I totally agree with, um, you understand that lots of other cultures are so much like our, our Portuguese culture and like humans are humans. And once you actually spend time to learn about others and use whatever empathy that you have, um, I, I think that begins to, to um, unpack lots of the things that you were taught. And I do think it's very important for our Portuguese community to begin this conversation about racism and how we have played um, a part in it and just be honest and move forward with it. I wanted to shift a little bit to the Black Lives Matter movement because um, that is, I believe, an important part in, 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 in our national debate. And I think Portuguese Americans should have a voice in that as well, whichever way. Um, and, uh, and so um, when the Black Lives uh, Movement uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement began with force, as I mentioned. It's been around, as you all know the you know the story about it as well as I do. But uh, after the death of George Floyd, the um, uh, and it took off into the different protests that uh, were held throughout uh, the nation. Um, why? Uh, first of all, I would like to know your stance on the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and why do you think uh, that? Uh, there have been such few organizations, Portuguese American organizations, that have taken a stand on it, um, and 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 I, I can name I can the, the only three that have taken a stance on it has basically been Palcas at a national level, and then on a statewide level, the California Portuguese American Coalition that put this forth. Uh, but we had a, a a debate on it with our board members. I can tell you that, and not not you know, about the issue, and um, and, and the organization that Michael belongs, which is the San Pablo which to date has been the only Holy Ghost Association that actually made a strong statement on it. Um, so first of all, what is your, what is your opinion of the movement? Um, and uh, why do you think that uh, the Portuguese American community hasn't come forth as organizations to, uh, uh, to, to be uh, with some kind of, uh, of a statement or, uh, on that? Uh, and I hear probably what some of you have heard before, it's not our issue. Uh, but it is a human issue, as uh, Rose said. It's, hum it's a human rights issue. So um, I'd like to know your, your, your take on it and, and why you feel Portuguese-American organizations have been um, silent on it. Yeah, um, as, as you've alluded to, Dinesh, I'm, yeah, I'm a part of the St. Pablo Holy Ghost, and we, it was really nice to, to be able to bring that up and have the, all the directorship unanimously approve that statement of, of support. And so, yeah, so I'm very much supportive of Black Lives Matter. Um, to me, it's, it's very clearly not a political statement. It is a equality and justice movement um, to, to be black, pro Black Lives Matter. Um, I try to think, like, I think in terms of uh, what, what I see in it, I see a lot of like successful intersectionality, right? Like I think when you listen to black thought leaders right now talk about how non-Black folks are also out marching, demonstrating in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's something that was not really seen in previous civil rights movements in the US. So I think that, that kind of broad community building is exactly what I wish the Portuguese community was doing more of uh, and was actually kind of being, being a part of, because uh, it's, it's really a moment that we're having. And I think building community outward, kind of like I alluded to earlier, is, is something that we are really well equipped to do. I think why we're not doing it right now, it's really based on fear and timidity, kind of what we've talked about already of folks don't wanna either have a conversation, they don't know how to have the conversation. And for those people who don't know how to like self-start, I think now is a perfectly fine time to start. And if, you know, I think the, the good news for the folks who are maybe timid, it's like no one is looking or waiting for the Portuguese community to like lead on this movement or this issue. So nobody's looking. So you can try and mess up and you may not get it right in the beginning, but like be a part of the movement, like just start somewhere and, and work from there. Anyone would like to add to that? Or, and, and your personal take on, on uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. 
Uh, I agree with what Michael said, and I definitely support the Black Lives Matters movement. And I think with the, I mean, it's just, it's simple. If, when the least are taken care of, then that means everyone else is taken care of. And with the history that we have in the United States and just world history and the atrocity that have been put on Black lives, it's very simple to me. So it doesn't, I'm not confused. And um, I do think once people understand the, the basis of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's very simple to move forward and support it. And then that leads to the support of everyone else. I'll chime in if that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, I obviously support the movement. I think I think it's an important movement, but I'm personally not somebody who goes out and protests. I, I don't make, you know, posts on my social media about it. I'm not an active member of the movement, although I support it in theory. And I think part of that comes from a place where, you know, just like the whole defund the police thing, I say, you know, I don't know enough about it to have an opinion. And part of it is also fear. And this is kind of what ties into your question, Vinesh, about why the communities might not be, you know, why they're not getting involved. There's this insecurity or this fear that people, you know, primarily in the black community are, gonna, are going to turn to me and say, well, who are you? What opinion do you have? Your ancestors started the slave trade. So you don't have a voice. You don't have a right to, to speak up or to have an opinion about this, right? So. I think that, you know, I can support it in theory, but also understand the sensitivity of the topic. I think nowadays people are always very careful about what they say and how they say it so that they don't sound racist, um, you know, and everybody's kind of walking on eggshells. Um, but this ties into our pre the previous topic that we were just discussing about our, our communities when they came here, they stuck to themselves right? They immigrated here. Yeah, that's great. But then they found other Portuguese people and they made communities. So it's not surprising to me that they would branch out now. You know, uh, it's a sad reality. I'm, I, I don't necessarily support that. I'm just saying this is, this is the reality that I see. A lot of our Portuguese communities, they find their sheep, they stick with one another, and they stay in that safe place. And so now with so much social disruption and so much um, controversy when it comes to these taboo topics like, like, like politics or, or religion or you know sexuality, this very conservative group of people, it doesn't surprise me at all that they're not speaking up now. Monique or David? Well, well, I definitely, oh, go ahead, David. To build on uh, what Amanda said, it is a lot of it uh, has to do with fear. Uh, speaking for myself, this subject is, for me, it is a very sensitive subject because I don't know how to react or respond to it. To me, it, it's common sense. It's a morality issue. It, it, there's only one race. It's the human race. And I, I stole that from Jane Elliott, who's an anti-racist uh, educator. So if you guys haven't heard of her, check her out. Um, it, it, to me, it's just common sense. I don't look at color. I don't look at race. I look at cultures. And, and essentially, that's, what I think, what the racism aspect is, is someone that's different culture. Someone made a comment here not to confuse culture and race. Well, they are two very separate things. Um, but being racism can also be based off, off of culture, not just the skin color. Um, as far as Black Lives Matter, it's definitely, I'm 100% in support of them. And like Amanda mentioned about the sheep, yeah, the Portuguese got into that sheep, the, their sheep all stuck together. There's, you know, if, if that one, I, I'm gonna mess up the quote from the Bible because I'm not a big Bible reader, but there is a, a, some, somewhere in scripture where it says, yeah, all, that, all the, the sheep were right here, but there was that one sheep, a sheep that was left aside. And so they were focused on that one sheep and all the others were like, well, how come you're not paying attention to us? Well, they're not the ones that are in danger at that time. So, I think until most of our people or most of our culture and, our, and 
they can grasp that and understand that they'll never understand what Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement means. Monique? Well, yeah, I, I mean, you know, first of all, I, I support Black, Black Lives Matter. I mean, I think 50 years after the Civil Rights uh, Act was passed and we're still dealing with issues where, you know, a Black person could be killed by a police officer on TV. That's just insane. Um, but with, among the Portuguese community, I think there's a couple of different things going on. One is the sheep thing. I think even if A, you do kind of agree secretly with, with BLM, you might then be afraid to say that um, at, a, at, the, at the FESTA meeting or, you know, anywhere else because you don't know who might attack you or who might, you know, get angry with you. And then there's, I think a lot of Portuguese people have this sense of like, we really care about how we look to other people and we want to kind of fit in with everyone and blend in with everyone. And nobody really wants to stick out, especially in a, in a subject like this. And I think too that there's like an inherent misunderstanding among a lot of Portuguese people because a lot of, at least here, here in the Valley, the people that I know, most people came in the 60s and 70s after the Jim Crow laws. And we're also in California where we kind of like to see ourselves as like, you know, colorblind. We like to see ourselves as multicultural. And so when they see something like Black Lives Matter, they don't really understand the purpose of it. Like, why do they need to have that? Because hello, you, you can vote, you're not a slave anymore. That was 300 years ago. So why are you still bothering me with this? And so it's kind of like, they really just don't get it. And I don't think, you know, and, and you know, we're talking about some people who have quite the class, you know, they have fourth grade, and then they came over here. And not to say that somebody who isn't educated can't understand this, but I just think that there's not like, especially like in a lot of like our Portuguese community, we don't have a lot of like this kind of you know, discourse where we're kind of talking about why these things are necessary. Like, so if you go on Facebook, all you see is like, oh, blue lives matter. And if you like, you know, black lives matter, then you don't want to kill the police and, you know, all lives matter and all this other stuff. And so it gets really confusing. And so people kind of see something and they're like, oh yeah, I see this meme and I kind of agree with it. So, and all my friends agree with it. So this is kind of the, the safe way to go. Can I, can I add one thing that yes. I, I feel like we, we, touched on but one thing that more directly kind of struck me with Denise to your initial question of like why do you think so few organizations have made a statement in support of Black Lives Matter like, mm -hmm. to me it is actually chilling that like the overlap of religious and civic organizations and this goes to I think Monique's point of where we can reach people if not through education maybe through faith and the, the fact that so many faith-based faith organizations who I would presume are you know predominantly Catholic and believe that all of us have souls uh, including black people, that folks have not made the statement of support, if nothing else, because you believe that all folks have souls and are people and should be treated equal. Like that to me is just boggling that there's not kind of a message of equality there coming from that source. Um, so that's just one thing I wanted to call out more directly. Indeed, indeed. It, uh, it, it is interesting that, but I think that may be a part of uh, what a couple of you touched upon this uh, to use the analogy of the sheep thing you know uh it's not our issue but it is our issue because we besides being a human issue uh it is it is our issue because we are part of the america mainstream whether we like it or not you know we shop at the american supermarket we can't uh the the social ghetto as i call them people hate that word but the social ghetto that sometimes the portuguese american community has created throughout the years uh, first of all, it's changing. And second of all, it, uh, in my perspective, it doesn't do the community uh, any good in the medium or long term. But I'm not here for opinions. I'm, it, it's the hardest thing in the world is being a, an opinionated person, being a moderator. Uh, so um, one other question, and we have had some very interesting questions. I'd like to pose them from the audience, uh, the people who are uh, participating as well. And I thank them all for being part of it. And one of them was... Um, I'm not going to say their names because I don't know if they want to be anonymous. So I'll just, you know, ask the question um, is, uh, do you think that younger families, and this is uh, some of you have families uh, already, uh, Monique has a family. Uh, do you think that younger families are passing on this racism to their kids? I don't have a family. <laughs> Um, your friends <laughs> without calling them out on <laughs> friends with kids and all of that and um, just knowing the younger generation I think that the younger generation 
and Portuguese American communities, I think some of them are waking up to be able to think outside of what they see in their home. Um, and I do think like people my age are starting to wake up for that as well and, and, and hopefully teaching their kids better. Um, and I do think that these conversations continuously and as Michael pointed out too, like most Portuguese people are Catholic. So these are things that I, I do think that should be addressed um, in the churches as well. Um, but I do think that there is hope for our future. Yeah, I, I see the youth definitely more uh, open and, and extending their families, but I don't think it's, it doesn't stop them from still making the occasional racial joke and still think it's funny. Um, and that's where there's a break in this, where, yeah, you're teaching your kids not to be racist, but then when you're with your friends, you're telling all these racist jokes and still laughing at them. Uh, and, and to build off what we had on our other forum, I think what we need right now is allies. And what we can do as a white man is stand up for them when we're hearing a joke that's racist, call them out on it and put it, you know, educate them on it and let them know why it's wrong. Because I know they wouldn't like to hear those jokes if it was about a Portuguese person. We'll laugh, some of them, but it's still offensive. Uh, and I think it's, it's knowing, you know, what line not to cross. I'd love to piggyback on David's uh, point because um, just a bit of a personal story. You know, I grew up in our Portuguese community here, but then when it was time to go to high school, um, I got accepted to a performing arts school that is in like the southeast area of San Diego where there's a lot more diversity and I'm in backgrounds and I believe that that experience kind of changed the person that I was. And I have vivid memories of coming home from school and hearing family members make racist jokes. Um, and I would call them out on it and say, that's not right, you shouldn't say that. And so they would do it kind of to get a rise out of me because they thought it was funny. But the fact that I like that's when it clicked for me because again you guys mentioned earlier exposure my exposure to different cultures and backgrounds and sexualities made me a more well-rounded person and then it made me realize that you know these harmless jokes were actually quite quite harmful um so going back to your initial question Vinish about younger families um I want to call out, there's a, somebody on our, um, our, our little chat who added a comment that said, racism is learned. And I very much agree with that. I very much believe that. Um, I think it's, imp obviously we want to raise our children to love all people because it, this is a human race issue and not a political or religious issue. Um, but we also need to make them realize that there are other people that will be racist. So it's not just teaching our kids to treat everybody equally, but it's also teaching them to be vigilant because the unfortunate reality is that there will continue to be racist people. There will continue to be injustice. Um, and it's important to, to teach our younger generations how to recognize that and how to address that and how to um, process it too. Um, but yeah. Indeed. You know, I think that um, slowly, you know, our Portuguese community is opening up a little bit more. I mean, definitely, it's definitely different than it was in the 90s where, you know, if somebody marries someone of a different skin color, that was very shocking. And, you know, everybody talked about it and they kind of just didn't really see them anymore. Um, and then people are feeling, you know, more comfortable, like, you know, coming out um, as, as gay and things like that. So in that way, I think it's, there is definitely improvement. Um, I think where we're getting stuck is as part of this like greater American culture where there's this like us versus them mentality where it's like, you know, you support black lives. That means you don't support white lives or that, you know, if people come here and we have a greater amount of people don't speak English and that somehow is going to make us the minority. And that's very scary to a lot of people. And so I think, you know, we still have a lot of work to do as far as, um, you know, there's a lot of people my age that, you know, again, they probably wouldn't call themselves racist, but I think that 
there are like inherent racist elements to not only our culture, but the American culture that children are learning. Um, and, you know, they learn it from their parents. And so like I, you know, after the George Floyd thing, I spoke to my, my children about it and I told them what happened. And of course, you know, my, my daughter was like beside herself. She was so upset. Like, why would that happen? But I've heard of other people who are just like, well, I don't talk to my kids about that because, you know, that's for them to decide. Like, I don't talk to them about that. I don't talk to them about politics because they can decide when they're older. But it's like, if we don't talk to them about that now, like, what are we parents for? We're parents to teach them values and to teach them about, you know, what's between right and wrong. And if we let them decide when they get older, who knows what they're going to decide. So I just think that's kind of a cop out. And I think that a lot of people kind of just like, don't even want to talk about it with children because it's like, oh, they're too young for that. But I don't think you're ever too young to learn about, you know, equality and, and, you know, the value of human life. Indeed. Um, we have a question that uh, is around what we've been discussing, and I'd like to get a couple of comments on it. How does uh, uh, Portuguese pride and nationalism uh, turn into racism? What are your thoughts on that? And how can the Portuguese community celebrate its culture while also condemning racism? Those are two loaded questions. I know they're very hard. Uh, excellent question, both of them. Um, but so when when does it uh, when does it stop just being a celebration of culture and it turns into nationalism? Um, and and when and how do we celebrate who we are, uh, including our past? Because we cannot uh, we cannot go back and rewrite history, uh, as uh, the historian would tell you. And so we cannot go back and erase the slave trade that we were so deeply involved in creating and being part of it. We cannot go back and erase our colonial powers. So how can we celebrate who we are and at the same time? condemn racism and what uh, in, in, in the US in our society. The difference is right there. I mean, we're not celebrating right now the slave trade that we were involved in. We're not celebrating the colonies that we had right now. We're celebrating our culture, our current culture that that's also very faith driven. Um, I don't know if that sheds a different light on, on what you just mentioned about both of those topics. I mean, those aren't things that we celebrate, so I don't know. I think, any, any, wanna, go ahead, go ahead, Rose. Yeah, I was just gonna say, anyone who knows me knows I'm very proud of being Portuguese. I'm very proud of Portuguese culture and um, the great contributions that did come from Portuguese culture. And then obviously the other things that come from it as well. Um, like to know me, you already know I'm Portuguese and probably like first five questions and I'm probably, you know, so I like, I'm very proud. Uh, yeah, like I'm very, <laughs> very proud of my culture. Um, but I also celebrate other cultures. Um, and I love the exposure to other cultures and learning about just human, humans around the world, because we're more alike than we are different. And I think what the problem that comes into is the ego of, of mankind and wanting to conquer. And that's the problem that we deal with and, and the dehumanizations of others for that um, you know, power and everything like that. So I do think you can be very proud of your culture, whatever your culture is, and also celebrate other cultures and just celebrate humanity in general. And you don't have to subjugate other people to live your life. I think this is a really difficult question because it's a very, very fine line between being proud of your roots versus coming off as pompous or single-minded to somebody else. So, I mean, in all honesty, it might just be a question of the receiving party, right? In my experience, you know, you definitely see a group of people in a suppressed culture um, that carry that grudge. Um, you know, for me, for example, uh, I worked at a language school and there was a Brazilian secretary. I was talking in the lobby with one of my students about uh, the difference between Portugal and Brazil and the different different dialects 
sex. And she turns around and looks at me and says, not trying to explain to the student, but she says, you know why I don't like you? Like to me personally, saying that I brought disease to her people and we, and I, you know, we rape their women. And so my point here is, you know, I think that Rose said was very articulate because I feel the same way, uh, you know, within 10 minutes of knowing me, I, the fact that I'm Portuguese blurts out of my mouth, it's something I'm very proud of. I love my culture and I'm proud of where I come from, but I also believe in human decency and being kind and, um, having compassion and uplifting one another. Um, but that's not always going to fly well with, with other people, right? Because you're going to have that generation of people that, that are more open and willing to accept and say, Hey, to each their own and other people that are going to say, Whoa, 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 that's a little overboard. You know, maybe you shouldn't have your shy Domingo on the wall or your picture of Biku or your, you know, your gold earrings, you know, so it, it's a slippery slope and it's, you know, it's a very sensitive time. Um, but as I feel like as long as we're compassionate and communicative and open and loving, um, you know, not to get too cheesy, but you know, you can't, you can't go wrong. Michael? I think, yeah. So I think a lot of it, uh, the answer to this question comes down to what we can control. And for me, that's a lot of kind of like how we construct our own narrative of how we think of our culture and our history. So to me, that's, that's everything from like the term fasanyaj, which like has such a kind of like first of its kind, like positive uh, groundbreaking connotation that I think is still used in historical contexts. Um, and that, that whole concept to me is like, is totally outdated. And so, so, because we don't delineate between what we did historically that was such a great achievement that didn't make someone else's life a living hell or wasn't a part of colonialism. We're not kind of saying like, well, we're for, we're Oroj Lumar and we were the first of the people, you know, people to really like accelerate, establish and accelerate a spice route, et cetera. Like we're not differentiating between like maritime prowess and what else happened on those routes. Um, another thing that to me that is more immediate is like seven minutes from my house, there's a beautiful park in Hayward. It's Portuguese Centennial Park. But, I, and I was there last week. Um, and, and it just like, it, it's, it's got Calçada, it's got Azulejo, it's got this like beautiful map of, uh, of Portugal mainland, Madeira and, and Azores. <coughs> but, uh, but it also, in the middle of it, it has a Pelourinho, which is like, was, uh, I just can't imagine being a descendant of uh, African slaves and seeing that in the middle of Hayward, California in 2020. And to me that like, that putting a pillory in the middle of a park, for example, is something that I think committees that are California Portuguese based have the choice to include or not include. Like they could have included a monument to uh, more directly tied to, to an immigrant, a Portuguese immigrant, which I think would be way different than, you know, putting up a, a, a post where folks were lashed and whipped to make an example and to, you know, not desert as, as slaves um, during colonial times. So I, th I think those kind of like choices that we, that we, can make ourselves and we can kind of choose how we represent ourselves is where, um, you know, we can still be prideful, but not be racist or venture near racism. Here's, go ahead, uh, Monique. Oh, so uh, what Rose was saying really spoke to me because I was the same way. Like if you get to know me, but then the first three or four questions, you know I'm Portuguese. And growing up, you know, the way to really make me angry is to ask me when did Portugal get its independence from Spain? Because I will go crazy. Because we had, we were independent way before Spain was. We had, there was a, the kingdom of Portugal well before there was ever a Spain. There was other, there's just a bunch of other kingdoms. And I think that like us being as an immigrant community, we're here fighting for, to be seen. You know, like we kind of have this idea where our Portugueseness makes us want to blend in with everyone but at the same time we want to be recognized we want to be heard we want to be counted and so it's kind of this like inner struggle that we have and you know how many times all of us have been asked oh are you speaking like speak do you speak spanish or you know are you from spain or whatever and i think like that kind of thing can also trigger a lot of nationalism it's like no i'm not spanish i'm portuguese or you know this and and somehow like this is better than that add on top of that our um our own education system in the United States, we're kind of like lean more towards, you know, we love the British, even though we hate them, but we love them. And so the British didn't like the Spanish. So then we don't like the Spanish. And we learn in school that the Spanish are 
bloody conquistadors and that they were super mean and and then compared to that like yeah we started the slave trade but we went to brazil we let other people marry brazil we let them marry the natives and we were kind con you know conquerors and we were we were nice to this and this and that um and i think in, even in our own like there's there are historians that talk about how you know colorblind the portuguese were compared to the spanish and all these other things so it kind of leaves us lulls us into this sense of uh security like oh we're not racist see i come from a background where you know we we went all over the world we're so multicultural yet we don't you know we could we can view people from Angola or people from brazil as others right because we're like the real portuguese and they're not so i think like you know a way to celebrate being Portuguese without necessarily being nationalistic is to not only to, to embrace the Portuguese-ness of every, of all of the Portuguese colonies, you know, the people all over the world who speak Portuguese and who have elements of Portuguese culture. Um, and, you know, like something we're doing in PFSA is we're trying to focus on, we're trying to be um, inclusive, you know, saying that anybody can come and join us. You don't have to be Portuguese to be a member of our society, but that what makes us different is that we are Portuguese, so we'll teach you the cool things about Portuguese culture. And I think if we just kind of choose not to ignore the, the dark past, and I think that's kind of, a lot of people do that, it's natural. Like we want to just forget that that ever happened. Like, no, the slave trade, let's just not talk about that. I had nothing to do with that. If we could like instead learn about it, teach our children about it, then that can kind of create more, um, I guess, more educated children and, and more inclusiveness in our, our community. I have another question, and we have lots of questions, and I don't know if we can get to all of them, uh, which is fantastic. But uh, we have one question here, um, and uh, again, I won't read the person's name, but it says, all four of my grandparents were from the island of Terceira. In the 1970s, after the carnation, okay, there goes Rose. Um, we are a minority here, uh, Rose, by the way. You know, it's mostly Piku and mainland, so you know we're a mi minority here. But uh, the... Uh, it's quality over quantity. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, the uh, so he says, uh, after the carnation revolution, so as you know, 1974, my paternal Vos sister came to Tulare County. So this person's from Tulare County. I got well acquainted with my great aunt, and she was chatty about the family history. Without the least uh, self-consciousness, she talked about a suitor, someone who wanted to uh, uh, marry her, whom she rejected, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> because he was trigueiro. I don't know if you know the word. Because he was trigueiro, which means too dark, uh, darker complexion. Um, so she rejected this boyfriend, she rejected this person who wanted to date her because he was trigueiro. And the question is, have you encountered this kind of color bar within the Portuguese American community itself? I can tell you it existed in, in the Azores quite often, actually. I, I was accused of that when, uh, when I was in school that I was not, uh, where did you come from? You know, because you're very trigueiro. So I know the word well. But anyway, have you encountered that color bar? That's a, uh, an, an excellent point in the Portuguese American community. Have you seen that? Maybe not with yourself, but have you seen this around? Silence. <clears throat> well, definitely it, it existed in my family. I'll tell you that. Okay. My grandmother, um, she used to, she was very big on us not getting tan. So like one time <clears throat> I went to Hawaii when I was probably about 14 and I got burned like really badly. So I came home, I was just like black because, I mean, I burned like three layers of my skin. I had blisters. It was really bad. So my grandma about had a heart attack. She was like, oh my gosh, you know, like your skin used to be white as snow and now you're <laughs> black as coal. And uh, there, I was always kind of like internalized that idea that if I got my skin too dark, that wasn't good. But um, I don't really see it too much among, you know, people like our generation. But one thing I do notice is that people from like other cultures, they tend to stereotype us as being dark, darker skin. So if like, you know, people say like, oh, I didn't know you were Portuguese, you have blue eyes. Uh, that used to drive my grandmother crazy. She, people said, oh, you know, she's so blonde. I, she doesn't look Portuguese. And she would say, what do Portuguese people have, horns? So, uh, you know, but then if I have friends that are darker skin, they don't think they're Portuguese either. So it's kind of this, I don't know, I, I find it more from the outside rather than from the inside. Okay. Anyone else has encountered that within the community? Seen it not so much with color, but uh, with the actual race. Um, 
I was with some friends in San Francisco and we were uh, walking on Fisherman's Wharf and you know, the, sh the chefs are there throwing the knives, cracking open uh, uh, crabs and stuff. And they turned to me in Portuguese and said, oh, isto não faz um bom trabalho, há outros que fazem melhor. He says, oh, this, is, this guy doesn't do a good job, I've seen better. And the chef who looked Asian responded in Portuguese and he was from Macau. So I think, you know, there's no, there's no color of Portuguese. Portuguese isn't a color. Um, you know, there's, it's all over. But have you seen, any of you have seen uh, any kind of sort of discrimination? Because I mean, this lady did not marry someone, although she found him handsome because she thought he was too trigueiro. So she was not going to marry him because of that. Uh, and Monique was saying, you know, how her grandmother, you know, had that reaction. So have you seen within the community people kind of look at the, a, a person different just because they are a little bit darker complected? I'm sure it's out there. I've seen people look at that based on the islands they're from. Oh, I'm <laughs> oh, yeah. from you know, I mean, I've seen that there. That, that, that hopefully, David, is just in, in, in <laughs> kidding. <laughs> hopefully, who knows? <laughs> You'd be surprised. I agree with Monique. I mean, it's, it's something that I saw and still see sometimes when I go back to the Azores, but you don't see it too much now in our, you know, younger generation here. I think, you know, with the U.S. being the melting pot that it is, and as generations continue to evolve, people continue to mix and look different, and, um, you know, we're getting further and further away from that generation of people that just had each other on the island you know, where everybody looked the same and act the same and preach the same. Um, so I'd like to think that that stigma will eventually go away. Uh, but it's still, you know, it, it's still around. Um, I always joke with people and say that if there were a line of suitors for me of all different colors, it didn't matter, you know, his education or or his background, my father would pick the Portuguese one for me, you know. So you know, it's still, it's still there, um, but I think it's going away. I'd like to think that it's going away. Um, you know, and just like Monique said, we're starting to see different shapes and sizes and colors. And um, I love David's story about the, the chef in San Francisco. Like that's always been my dream is to like be in a target and hear someone talking shit about me. And then I just turn around and say, you know, <laughs> That's always been my like, yeah, you know, stick it to them because we're all we're all different. Um, we're, we all look different, but inside we're all the same. <laughs> I have a question, Denise. Uh, Senor Denise. Uh, Denise is fine. Yes. Please. Sorry. Uh, that makes me old. No, it's respected. Respect. Uh, Go ahead. Is the question in regards to within the Portuguese community? Yes. Yes. For example, this lady did not marry someone or did not find him uh, because he was too trigueiro. So it wasn't acceptable to be too trigueiro. You were less than basically that's the, you know. Yeah. I think I've noticed that, especially like, you know, being in Terceira, um whenever I'm there and there is um, some Brazilian people there. And again, it, it's still like, uh, uh, they're Brasileiros, but so they're not really Portuguese. Um, and so like that, I mean, yeah, I mean, it definitely still is there. And then obviously with um, the mixing of cultures, then sometimes you do get somebody with a darker skin tone, which, I mean, I appreciate it when I go tanning that I can actually get color. Um, but yeah, it definitely is still there. And even here in the States, it's still there too, because they just look at, okay, well, you're not 100% Portuguese. What, where is that color coming from? Even though you looking at histories and the Moors in Portugal yep. and everything like Seven, that. Yeah, 700 years, so it's a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have you another know, I just want, oh, Go ahead, sorry. go ahead, Monique. I just go want to add one little thing. So I think I was thinking back to the, the question. Um, and one thing we have to think about too is that you know people come from the Azores 
it's not so much about, you know, I don't want to look like a, an African, an Af person from Africa, but there's also a class issue to it because if you're dark, darker skin, it means you work out in the fields and you're poor. And then if you have lighter skin, that means that you stay in the house and you're wealthier. So, th so there's also that to throw into it as well. And then it, I think that in the Azores it was more about that than it, it but obviously what, here it changed. Um, there's a question here on someone said that uh, recently read a book that among its definitions was that there is no such thing as a non-racist that we need what we need to be is and I read the same book uh, is uh, anti-racist meaning that silence is no longer an option so what do you think so there's no the the thesis of this book basically is that there's no such thing as a non-racist. If you say you're not racist, we all are racist in some way or another. What we need to be is anti-racist. Uh, and and the thesis, and and uh, the outtake on that is the take on that is that uh, being an anti-racist means that uh, silence is no longer an issue uh, or no longer an option. I should say. Uh, what is uh, a couple of thoughts on that, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's I hadn't heard that before, but I think it's spot on in that like we to to just be a passive uh not to, to passively claim you're not racist is not enough i mean the the world was constructed in such a way that it favored people in power who are generally lighter skin and until that is actually actively uh taken head on and people try to deconstruct what has already been built uh, i mean i think if you're just so passive to the point of saying well i'm not racist and you're not doing anything to counter racism because it's an actuality that is a problem that allows that that's so passive that it allows racism to to continue to exist any different thoughts on that i'll add to that um i think you know that whole notion that there is no you know we are all racist in in one way or another really just goes back to you know a sense of perception and identification right you know walking out on the street we identify people by the color of their skin and you know it's not necessarily a derogatory thing mm -hmm. to say, you know, oh, the woman with the black hair or, you know, the man with the dark skin, right? And I think what, what starts flirting with, with racism is when the conversation shifts to not just identification, but a sense of superiority, right? Or inferiority. So that's, that's really the difference because of course racism exists inherently because that's how we identify one another. But the associations that we make with that identification is really where where you can shift either anti-racism or racism um, and this reminds me of an interview I saw with Morgan Freeman very famous black actor and um, there was a Jewish man interviewing him asking him his thoughts on a black history month and he became very unsettled and he said I think it's stupid why does it exist you know so as to say racism is a thing because we make it a thing right um, so I thought that was really an interesting, an interesting point too, because, you know, like you said, Dinesh, earlier, we can't go back and erase the past, but all we can do is kind of change how we treat each other in the future. Um, so I think that there's definitely a difference when we say the word racism between identification and um, the association that we make with that, with those um, associations. One other one other question on, on that came through, um, and I have also one final one before we uh, we're almost out of time. Is um, the uh, uh, there's a question also that uh, your thoughts on the current states uh, of the political world when it comes to the Black Lives Matter racism and how it's perceived? It seems like um, there's some people that may shy away from it because uh, BLM equals liberal and some people who may identify with liberalism or with being liberal in America, that's a total different thing than liberalism as, as a historian could tell you. But the, uh, the, the idea that uh, the Black Lives Matter is, is identified directly with being liberal, also how the gaslighting and flood of misinformation is reinforcing the already racist kind of leaning notion. So from what I understand, you know, um, the question, you know, there's a common question is uh, basically, um, is, uh, it, it, do you think that people, uh, maybe the, the, the person was inferring to this, you think that people shy away from Black Lives Matter because it's just, 
as a connotation to one political movement over another? Any thoughts, Michael? You, 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 yeah, you, you hit the button. Go, go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Yeah, I think that's definitely a phenomenon that happens. I, I think it's similar to um, other kind of shortcuts that people take when it comes to identifying what they believe in politically and socially, uh, and you know, not not thinking through what their political position might actually want. They, they just kind of follow people attached to a narrative. Um, so in this case, for Black Lives Matter, I think if you you know, hear the president of the United States saying that Black Lives Matter is a, is a terrorist organization or it's related to Antifa or radicals or anarchists or all the above. I think and people just choose that to follow that individual, then yeah, they're not going to question themselves. So the, I think that is that the, the not questioning yourself and not thinking critically is generally a problem, which is where misinformation becomes a problem. And uh, I, I don't, I think anything with misinformation, uh, I mean, there's, in terms of like the online presence of misinformation, which touches on my day job because I work as a program manager in content moderation. Um, what the problem there is that if folks don't think critically, you can't necessarily make them and you can provide all the cues in the world like fact checking or labeling the source of relevant information, but people can always go and just find the source they want to hear things from and ignore a fact check label. Uh, so so the, the problem is that th people need to think critically. Do you think to add to that? I, I also think that, you know, there's also safety in belonging to something. I feel like lately, you know, with so many things that have been hot topics this year, you know, COVID, Black Lives Matter, Trump, everything seems so divided. It's like left or right, Democrat or Republican, police, George Floyd. And I, I hate it, to be honest, because, you know, why, why do I need to be one or the other? Can't I have, can't I have my own opinion, right? And I think, you know, to expand on, on Michael's point, I think that what's happening is that people tend to just fall into this bucket because it's safer versus saying, well, you know, I don't agree with defunding the police, but that doesn't mean that I'm anti BLM, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I really liked his point about, you know, critical thinking and not just, um, you know, jumping on the bandwagon because uh, it feels safe. Okay, the last point, um, we went over what I promised you, which would be about an hour and 15 minutes, but thanks for sticking around, everyone. Uh, and so the last point basically is bringing it back to our community, bringing it back to the Portuguese American community. Um, you know, uh, what do you feel that we can do um, uh, as a community with our organizations, individually, but all, with our organizations as well? What would you like to see some of these organizations, and I think some of you have already mentioned you'd like to see the organization actually take a stand. That would be a good start, obviously. But, you know, other than taking a stand on Black Lives Matter, I'm not taking a stand, you know, to acknowledge who we are and, uh, and maybe even the, the teach our, the history that some of you mentioned that Portuguese Americans don't know. And I wholeheartedly agree. They don't know their history uh, when it comes to the slave trade. We don't know their history when it comes to the African colonies uh, most. And, and, and sometimes we don't even want to know the history when it comes to America itself, uh, as Michael mentioned, past the fifth grade. And so uh, the, uh, the idea here that I'd like to get from you, is there a couple of pointers that you'd like to put forth, um, a couple of action items, let's put it that way, in, business, in the business world, that you would like to see that maybe the Portuguese American community, whether it be through organizations like the California Portuguese American Coalition, uh, like PALCAS at a national level, um, like... Um, like uh, the Institute at Fresno State and some of the other the Center for Portuguese Studies, you know, at the universities, uh, because I think we can, what would you like to see uh, uh, a couple of action items that could be done that could make uh, the community a lot more inclusive and, 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 uh, and uh, a little bit more off of the taboos that uh, Amanda mentioned that we cannot talk about in the Portuguese American community. What can we do? And I'll add a little bit of a tweak to it. Uh, can it does it have to be only these organizations does it have to be basically the california portuguese american coalition because they're a little more political not not partisan but political does it have to be palcas the national level does it have to be an institute or a center but 
can the Portuguese Holy Ghost Festas, can the folklore groups, can the bands, can the popular organizations also do something in the community in your, in, in your perspective? And if, if so, what are one or two things that you might think about that could be done? Anybody like to start? Uh, Rose, I think you were, you raising your hand? No, but I can say something. I, I do think, um, you know, the personal is political and in regards to the Portuguese American community and how we show up here in America and how we show up personally is very important. Um, we, you know, educating yourself first or having the con these kinds of conversations that are very important for us to have within our community and then ex outside of our community. And, and this is the first step to recognize that we should open ourselves up to other things, especially being here in the United States of America, which is a very multicultural country. Um, and I do think more representation in the, the Holy Ghost festivals, more representation in Catholicism in general, um, and the community, and it's, it's up to us to start that and then hopefully spread it. So it's nice to see that organizations are already doing that. And then I take it as a personal challenge to do that as well. Anytime that I'm having conversations with my parents or other Portuguese American friends that I do have. And even when I'm in Trisada and having those conversations because, you know, they're like, oh, oh, you take pictures with like a whole bunch of different looking people. And I was like, yes, and they're all different people. And so um, I do the best that I can to spread the knowledge that I have and encourage people to use their critical thinking abilities. And if they don't have it, find someone who does and, and have those conversations with them. Yeah, to elaborate on that, I think the community right now is definitely on the right path, slowly. Uh, you're starting to see, you mentioned the bands and the folklore, those are two hot spots for me. And you definitely see the doors opening up a little bit more. Uh, the Portuguese band, for example, had a Mexican president for six or seven years. Uh, and he was one of the best presidents they had. So you see it, it it's, it's, they're becoming more and more open. And I think it's once the organizations feel comfortable that they're not gonna lose that culture or that tradition uh, and opening the door and allowing to share your culture with other, other nationalities and, and not feel afraid that you're gonna lose it, that you're gonna see more and more of that happening throughout all our organizations. And I've seen it with folklore, Ispirit Santo, other nationalities are actually being reinas and it's not just a, a white girl doing it, you know, or a Portuguese person doing it. it it's been slowly progressing. So that along with our self account of our own accountability, you know, when we see something is wrong or being said that's not right, not to be afraid to say something and stand up for it. A couple of thoughts? I think um, a challenge that can be presented here at the niche is you know, a lot of times when you have these organizations, you have a mixed, a mixed group of people on the board. So for example, when I was on the board of directors of our local hall, you know, you had young and old. So although we might all agree that it's important to make an effort to move forward, you're still going to have, you know, maybe an older generation that where you're going to encounter resistance, right? Um, so I could definitely see why there's challenges there. But as far as integrating this forward movement with our um, communities, I think that there's a lot of um, opportunities, even if we just start small. So for example, um, our local Portuguese community is really supportive of the youth. They have various scholarship programs, uh, the youth group, the dance group, you know, a lot of kids going to school that need like community service hours, like they could arrange for, um, you know, a kind, some kind of trip where they donate things to, to the women's shelter in Baja, you know, or, um, you know, do some kind of volunteer work where there's Portuguese representation there in support of other cultures and races. That's definitely an idea. Um, another thing that comes to mind, you also mentioned like the Festa. Here in San Diego, um, our Festa do Espírito Santo is actually San Diego's oldest ethnic festival. And you have no idea how many people I've met 
outside of my Portuguese community that don't even know we exist. So that to me, there's a huge opportunity there for outreach. Invite people to come to the festa and maybe that will grow to their participation, their inclusion, but maybe just for now we start by saying, hey, come down and try some sardinhas or come listen to our polka sounding Portuguese music or you know, um, include them, expose them the same way we want to expose ourselves. Um, and maybe if we start small, um, the organizations on a larger scale might come around. I think it's already happening a lot. I totally agree with you, Amanda. Um, like if you look at the fraternal societies, I think like both Luzo and PFSA, we're actually seeing um, non-Portuguese people come in and get involved. And, uh, you know, the, we see a lot of kids in Luzo dancing that, that are Portuguese. Uh, my husband, for instance, is not Portuguese at all, but he's been adopted. So he was 2030s president of the PFSA, and I didn't want him to do it, but he did it. So uh, he loves Portuguese soccer and Portuguese food, and we loves going to the Azores. So I think I, I, I agree with what other people have said as far as, like, we just kind of, instead of hugging what's great about being Portuguese to ourselves, we share it with others. We in, not only invite them to come to our events, but we also make the effort to go to other people's events. Because I think too, there's this kind of idea that it's like, oh, I don't want to go over there. That's, I don't know what that's all about. I'm just comfortable here in my own thing. Um, if we, if more people kind of extend themselves out to be uh, influ or not influenced, but sort of just at least, you know, expose themselves to other cultures and other people and get to know those people, I think that already helps. And I think too, that if more of us, um, I think there's actually a lot of Portuguese people out there that kind of agree with us, but they're afraid to say anything and they're afraid to, you know, get the ire of other people who, um, you know, don't agree with them. So I think if there's more people that are not afraid to say, hey, that's not funny, that's, you know, you shouldn't say that. Like, I, will, I don't agree with that. I'm sorry. Like, you know, say whatever you want, but not in front of me. I think we have more and more of that Then it'll encourage other people to, to not be scared. And it's like, I, like I so admire the San Pablo Holy, Holy Ghost for, you know, doing something that's really brave. I mean, it sounds weird. And we're in the United States of America. We have free speech, but it's brave to support something. Um, so, yeah, I think that all of those things will definitely help. Michael, you should have the last word since you are the brave one of the San Pablo, <laughs> representing the Brave Association. But indeed, I, I do have to uh, echo what Monique said. I, I think it took a lot of guts for a Portuguese American organization to step outside of its uh, comfort zone, let's put it that way, and and say, you know, what I've heard from other organizations, because I've, I've, I've contacted a few of them. Uh, and they all say, it's not our issue. It's not our issue. And that was why, I, that was one of the first questions I asked you. But, I, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the San Pablo Holy Ghost Association is the only local Portuguese American association in California. Uh, and I don't know about the rest of the states, but in California, that actually made a statement. Uh, and kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And shout out to the board too, for being on sure. again, yeah. uh, in support of it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, Looking at our community, at least in the San Pablo area, looking at, like, we have Black members, uh, we have multi-ethnic members who've had Black queens and side maids, like, the idea of not saying anything isn't doing right by our own membership. Um, and then I think in terms of going back to, to action items, I mean, I think there's, there's so much you can do to start small. You can have a conversation, which costs nothing. It literally can be, you know, happen concurrently with an event or any kind of gathering you're having at one of your associations or halls. Uh, I think what David alluded to of kind of nipping inappropriate comments about race on the bud, I think that is an easy thing to do. Um, and then I think from there, it's, uh, I think there's an opportunity to kind of go with your strengths. Like we, if you, we are all community organizers, we're all really good at logistics uh, related to events, uh, to, to fundraising. And I think if, you know, if we shift our thinking to the same way when we do food drives or we do, you know, toy donations for the holidays, like the idea of helping out other groups that are looking for help in terms of addressing systematic societal level problems. Like we could fundraise for local black justice or race focused organizations um, that would be really easy. And it literally could be as simple as like a fish dinner, bake sale, et cetera. And then the last thing I wanted to say was building on what, what Amanda said, uh, 
it's just that when you look at like the future of, of our societies and of our organizations, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's going to be an increasingly white future and increasingly like insular Portuguese future. It's going to be way more multi-ethnic, multinational, et cetera. And I think reaching out and thinking about why those big festivities in San Diego or like crab feeds are so have such broad appeal. And the fact that we, you know, accept folks who don't look like us when we're doing fundraising for our own societies um, needs to be challenged a little bit more. And I think there's, a, you know, if, if for nothing else, there's a self-preservation angle there to building community and building support for organizations. And people will know who the Portuguese are and it'll kind of give them a different read of who the Portuguese are. They're community members who want to have like a, not to end on a cheesy note, but they want to have a better environment for everyone, not just for themselves. Do you feel, uh, I, one more question. Do you feel that um, we are inclusive enough or we should maybe uh, think well, a, a, as part of this inclusivity that you're looking at the different communities that compose the human mosaic that is the United States of America. What about the, uh, and we don't have a lot in California, the East Coast has more, but what about the African Portuguese speaking countries, the people, and there are a few from Angola, from Cabo Verde, Brazilians, um, obviously, uh, whether they're uh, white, uh, you know, or black. Um, because um, uh, th that is one of the issues that, you know, we, I, I feel, and, and uh, disagree with me, please, if you do, I feel we don't do enough in the Portuguese American community is reach out to the other Portuguese speaking countries whose relationship sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, of tension, you know, as there's going to be, because it's a brand new thing. We were colonizing power until 1974, so it's not that far. I know you're all young, and 74 seems like, you know, uh, it is the last century. I know that. But it wasn't that long ago. And so our history with, with, with as being a colonial power is very recent. But we do have a pretty good relationship, working relationship, government-wise, between Portugal and the Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa. And we have a good relationship, obviously, with Brazil that's been independent for a much, much longer period of time. And so can we do better even within those people that exist, than those people, the Harara people, you know, people from, from those countries that exist in, in, in California? Because I still, I still see, especially in the older generation, and David is, is right, I agree, not as much in the younger generation, but even in the younger generation, even in people under 30s, I still see oh, he doesn't speak Portuguese, he speaks Brazilian, and it irks me to no end. Uh, or he doesn't, you know, uh, you know, he doesn't speak, or, or they're Brazilian, they're not as well. And we've made an effort to the California Portuguese American Coalition. We have one board member from Brazil. And we got questions, why a board member from Brazil? Because we have to be inclusive of all the other Portuguese American, uh, Portuguese speaking countries. And sometimes some of these groups are so small that they cannot have a voice themselves. Do you think that we can also be more inclusive in that aspect? Yes. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think we should think of it as any, like, a, a partnership with a really big purpose. And not to say any one action or partnership kind of reverses history or makes up for history. But it, I mean, why not? Um, we we like to talk about Portuguese culture being, you know, international or the Lusophone uh, being so global. Or we like to talk about you know Portuguese being the fifth or sixth most spoken language in the world. But like. We don't really dive into that and we don't really acknowledge that in kind of an active way of saying, okay, come into our house and yeah, let's do a joint event or, you know, joint initiative for, for whatever purpose. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think before we can, I think in, in some ways it's just inherent in our culture because we notice like, oh, you know, you're from Tercet, I'm from St. George, you're from the continent, I'm from the Azores, you know, even an island of St. George, oh, you're from Velas, you're from Tulip. And it's like, we're always like competing with each other. So it's like, we can't even accept each other as, you know, we're all Portuguese and we're all in this together. I have to steal this quote from the, from the Portuguese kids. Um, from all, we're all pop, from one pop sick, we're all a bunch of crumbs. And so I just love that saying because it's so true. And we have, if we see that about each other, then maybe we can actually see that about people from the outside. But I think education has a lot to do, uh, is, is very needed too, because like I just had somebody a few weeks ago message me and she said that, you know, her dad told her, no, it wasn't her dad. Somebody else told her that, you know, the war of Angola, all the, all the white people were kicked out and all of these things happened. And I know that my mom told me that too, but that's not really the truth of what happened uh, after the civil war. Um, and so it's like, I think if, you know, part of what needs to happen is more education 
especially about older generation, because they came here with certain ideas and they believe those ideas, they're teaching their kids those ideas. And then now these kids are teaching the next kids these ideas. And if we can kind of have everybody understand what actually happened, then maybe that would kind of pave the way to more inclusion. Guys, thank you so much. Um, we're out of time and I appreciate it. This was a fascinating conversation. I think that maybe we can do this again sometime um, and focus even a little bit more on our community rather than deal you know, with this issue that we were dealing with racism and discrimination. But I think we need in the Portuguese American community to hear the young voices and how we can move forward. The community is not going to be the same 25 years from now than it is today. It already isn't the same. And I always tell folks, you're doing the same stuff that you were doing 50 years ago. That's why it's not working. It's not because <laughs> it's not because people are less Portuguese. It's just not working. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I will probably be chastised for this, but I'll use my son as an example. My youngest son was uh, lives in Sacramento. Michael, the same name as Michael here. It was a popular name there <laughs> about 30 some years ago for the Portuguese American uh, uh, parents. And um, and, and, and there's a service that uh, if you don't get it, I can I can have you uh, get it uh, at no charge, I believe, from Flat. Um, I believe probably David gets it. Um, it's from Publico. Uh, Publico is one of the Portuguese's leading newspaper, um, and they have an English language service that they that they subscribe to. Um, and Flat is putting the bill on it, which is good uh, to, to to make it known throughout the Portuguese American community, second, third generation. And so you get like a one week notice from them. It takes you about eight to 10 minutes to read it, you know, to read through all the headlines and maybe the two or three articles that, you know, are important to you. Um, and it keeps you updated in the Portuguese American community uh, or the Portuguese world in Portugal. And he said that that's exactly what I want. I want those 10 minutes. I can't spend an hour or two or three a day on knowing what's going on in Portugal and in the Portuguese American community. My life is busy, but I do want to stay connected and I can do about 10 to 15, 20 minutes a week on knowing what's going on in Portugal. So the community is different. Not everybody has the dedication and the time that some of you have, you know, to the Portuguese organizations. And so I think that I'd like to bring you back maybe in a couple of months and we could talk about how we move forward as a community without the issues of racism and discrimination and all the other tough issues that we try to talk about. But uh, it'd be great to have your take on it and how do we move forward because um, we're kind of dying with the same ideas, and 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 I I think that we need to we need to we need to make a, the the community survive, and it's not going to survive. Uh, and I think San Pablo, for example, has great ideas. You know, the idea of their hall is to me phenomenal. Um, I think it's the answer to all. To, I shouldn't say all, as Amanda cautioned. You know, let's not put everything in one in one basket. But um, let's not make generalizations. But a lot of the halls. In the, in the Portuguese American community in 25 to 30 years, they're gonna to have to do the San Pablo uh, initiative if they want to survive. So anyway, thanks to all of you. We'll be talking about this. Uh, kudos, it was really enlightening for me. I, it makes me feel good about the community as an older person um, and to have such bright uh, and, and, and intelligent and caring and empathetic people uh, such as yourselves in the Portuguese American community. Uh, you make us all proud. I know that's for sure. You make me proud. And I know you make the whole community proud. I'm not, well, not going to be cheesy, but and I'm not going to get emotional. But um, but I do. Yeah, uh, it's part of being old. Uh, but it's the the idea. But thanks to all of you. This was enlightening. This was great. And, and you're all awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. Boa noite. Até breve. Adeus.